Welcome to today's COVID-19 update. We're speaking with the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony. Minister Anthony, again, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on the program. Yes, sir. Uh, let's begin with COVID curb. We haven't spoken about it, you know, in a little while, intensely, as I mean. Um, what is going on? I know that you were planning, you had specific plans for Bartica. Well, uh, through Operation uh, Kofi Curb, we have been um, going out to a number of communities. We'll intensify that during these, this holiday season. And as we mentioned before, because we identify Bartica as a transition area, we have, right now, we have three teams um, in three separate mining districts. And we'll be working with uh, the persons in those areas uh, to identify if anyone has uh, COVID-19. The teams are equipped with uh, testing kits, these rapid testing kits. So if they have any suspicion of anyone, um, uh, you know, have signs and symptoms pertaining to COVID-19, they can easily do the rapid tests. So these teams have already been deployed. They're in the area. They'll be doing a lot of screening and hopefully we'll be able to detect anyone that is positive. Now, the areas that they have gone to are those areas where we expect uh, persons would be coming from uh, and passing through Bartik on their way out maybe to the coast. So if we are able to identify the positive at the source and um, isolate them, then it prevents them from ex uh, being exposed to other persons. All right. In terms of the teams that you're talking about, I know they're all medical work, um, health workers, so obviously they undergo uh, training. What sort of uh, periodic training do you have? I know aside from those that we have spoken about before. But the, these teams that we have sent out is a combination of persons from the joint services and the, the medical staff. And each team, they have uh, doctors assigned to them and other health personnel. So it's a, a, a kind of a broad-based team. And um, they'll be spending a couple of days in each of those locations. So we anticipate that we will discover some positives. And, um, and once we discover those, we'll be able to take the, the relevant precautionary measures. Right. As we're talking about geographic locations, uh, I know we're continuing monitoring in Bartica. Um, the numbers have gone down a little bit. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, well, I, as I anticipated, because most persons who have been in isolation are now coming to uh, closer to that 10-day period when we can discharge them. So we have started a process of discharge. So we have moved from 80 yesterday to 68 today. And that process is going to continue as people uh, get to that 10-day uh, asymptomatic period. Um, so we an anticipate these numbers to come down. We have continued testing in Bartica where we're not finding positives, which is a good sign. So we hope that once people keep complying, that we'll reduce the, the amount of active cases in Bartica. All right. And the other regions we have previously spoken about Orealis and so what have been... We still have a few active cases in Oriel and Ciparuta, but not at that alarming level that we had maybe about two weeks ago. And again, similar processes are in place um, where we have been working with the village council. We have our regional health team there and uh, they go in. They have uh, resident doctors that are located there and they offer advice. And again, most of the cases that we have there are asymptomatic. So basically, once they complete that 10-day period, we'll then discharge them. Okay. Minister, we have spoken about training a lot, and we're coming down to the end of the year, and I know a lot of those training would uh, be completed. What uh, specifically do we have going into the new year? Well, again, um, guidelines would change. Clinical guidelines, we anticipate as we get more knowledge and so forth about um, uh, the disease, that those clinical guidelines would change. New medicines would become available. 
if we are able to acquire them here in Guyana and we have them and we made them available, then we'll have to change our clinical guidelines. Every time we update our clinical guidelines, it is important that we teach our staff um, about these guidelines so they are more aware and that they can utilize these protocols that we have developed. So I anticipate some training uh, in the area of treatment and care. Um, we will run some more training on the use of ventilators. Uh, I think that's important. It's not only for COVID-19 patients, but it's a skill once acquired can be used in other areas of, um, of health. Uh, so we will be running a series of clinical training over the um, for next year relating to COVID. We anticipate that we'll be doing some additional training for our laboratory staff. Uh, that too is very important. Uh, we'll do some more training in terms of vaccines because as we, more information becomes available and we become clearer on which vaccines are coming to Guyana, then we will run specific training dealing with vaccines. Um, cold storage, cold chain, uh, you know, how to utilize the vaccines and a whole host of other things, even uh, processes in terms of how you record uh, on, the, on the card that we'll be issuing, how you keep our record so that we can go back and check. And then with these vaccines that we'll be using, because they're a two-dose vaccine, we'll have to come back to the person after 21 days in some cases, or a little bit longer in other cases, depending on the vaccine. So we need to have those records and be able to find the persons and get, get them to get their second dose, their booster dose. So it would entail a lot of work and um, I anticipate that for the first quarter of next year, a lot of our efforts would be uh, training personnel in, in these types of areas. Outside of this, of course, we have um, other types of training that would be done. Uh, we have other disease-specific training, so whether it's filaria, mal uh, malaria, uh, diabetes, other chronic non-communicable diseases, those type of training would also be ongoing. Through our partnership with PAHO, we expect to have a number of training courses that will participate um, under the auspices of PAHO. Some of these might be virtual. Others, we are hoping, as, as uh, the COVID situation clears up, might be in-person training, but we'll see. But generally, we do a lot of training with PAHO as well. Um, WHO has, at its last uh, World Assembly, has identified a number of areas for countries to work on. So I anticipate that we would also be um, looking at some of those recommendations and we'll have to train people accordingly to the new standards and guidelines that WHO is putting out. So we'll have a number of other training in those areas. And then depending on the needs that we have, we would um, also run training. As you know, we have a department of training within the Ministry of, of Health. And through that department, uh, we do train persons in um, nursing, uh, various levels of nursing, various types of nursing courses, uh, midwifery. We have medex training programs. We have community health, uh, health worker training. We have a number of training for uh, like assistant pharmacists uh, and so forth. So all these training, you will have the more structured programs um, also being run next year. Some of it might take the form of a hybrid training. Uh, others might be uh, smaller groups in person. But we want to uh, bring back some sense of normal CTOR training program. So there are lots of um, educational programs that we'll be running next year. OK, thank you. Uh, you, were, you mentioned antigen in, in, in there. What we know recently you got a donation from the from uh, ExxonMobil specifically, but you have been meet, um, getting donations from members of the private sector. Um, I want to ask about that, and has it been to what you've expected? Uh, what particular area would you require added support? And secondly, 
oh, in terms of our medication, we haven't spoken specifically. We have the, the test kits and then remdesivir that Minshu is using as well. Do we have enough uh, as we speak now? So again, um, we have been working with a number of private sector entities and uh, they have been kind enough to give us donations. The latest being uh, the donation that we received from ExxonMobil. They, um, this, they give us $32 million, which would be used to procure antigen test kits. And, and that's a welcome donation because we want to shift the paradigm in how we test using these antigen kits. Uh, we have also bought some antigen kits separately. So we now have an adequate amount of antigen kits uh, that are available for testing in country. Uh, in addition to the antigen testing kits, we had recently received a donation of about a million masks. Uh, these are the surgical procedural masks. And um, we, we've received this from the Dubai and, uh, Foundation and the DDL. Uh, so these two uh, private sector entities, NGO and private sector entities, have combined and have been able to uh, make this generous donation to us. Of course, once we receive these things, what we have done is to make sure that our health facilities uh, get adequate supplies. So we have been um, giving that out to our health facilities. We have also made um, a donation from the supplies uh, to the police and to the army, because as you know, during this period, they'll be interfacing more with the public and we also want them to be protected. So we have uh, donated uh, generous amounts to them to ensure that uh, they also remain protected. Uh, we have other uh, private sector entities that have expressed interest in donating, and we have pointed them in some of the um, areas where we feel that their donation would be more uh, welcome. Uh, PPEs, uh, we have been uh, consuming quite a lot of PPEs and therefore um, we are constantly in need for more PPEs. Sometimes I think that our health workers now are using the thing in excess and um, that is another area that we have to look at because our consumption pattern for PPEs have gone up tremendously. So a couple months ago, people were complaining they weren't getting it. Now it seems like when they get it, they're wasting it. So that's something that we have to look at uh, very carefully because these things are very expensive. They cost a lot of money. And of course, there's all, always challenges in procuring it from the global supply chain. So, um, you know, we need people to take responsibility as well and not just use these things and, and uh, throw them away very quickly. All right, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you something aside from COVID-19. The Auditor General's report uh, just released and I read that it says $75 million was overpaid to contractors at the Liliandal Hospital. Uh, you have spoken about this during the budget debate, but what is being done to ensure that does not happen under your watch? Well, I'm very happy that the report uh, by the Auditor General is now out and that uh, people can see for themselves what has transpired because, you know, we had major difficulty with um, how these contracts were awarded, what was done. Um, and how payments were made and, and a, whole, a whole, whole host of other things. So um, the Auditor General report, I'm sure, would reflect some of these things. It's unfortunate that um, whoever was managing the project was not able to do accurate measurements and to pay um, as per the work that was done. Uh, we have intensified our scrutiny because we had to complete the project but we have intensified our scrutiny to ensure that um, we pay it by measured works. And I think once we are able to do that, then some of these excesses that we have seen in the past, uh, we would be able to curb them. Going forward, uh, I think generally, um, we need to have a stronger department that oversees uh, these infrastructure projects. 
because it's not only Ocean View um, that we inherited that was in this terrible state of affairs. We also have the ministry headquarters that um, there were all kinds of flaws in the contract and uh, poor performance uh, that we have noted and that's why the building is not completed. We have a facility that is being built in Rheinveld um, and again, that project is not completed, although it should have been completed. So there are a slew of infrastructure projects that should have been uh, properly done, but because of poor management, poor oversight, um, these things have not been done properly. They, they, they have exceeded the contract time. In some cases, they probably went over the budget. So these are things that we have to look at. So I, I'm... I hope that the Auditor General would have looked at those as well because it's important that people understand um, what has happened with these projects and we need to hold people accountable as well. So uh, with the information that is going to come out of the Auditor General's report, I am hopeful that we can take some actions with these errant contractors and the persons who have been involved. All right. Uh, finally, I have one last question for you. I know that you have a lot of programs that you intend to roll out within uh, the new year. One of those is file area. And I, I believe, based on what you've said, it, you're aiming to basically eradicate it from Guyana. Could you tell us a little bit about that? File area has been with us for a long time in Guyana. And there have been many attempts to eliminate file area. Um, some people might remember we had a program where we were infusing deck into salt. So when people consume cooking salt, uh, they were also getting their medication with the cooking salt. And this was aimed to reduce uh, the filaria larvae that uh, might be in people's uh, body. So that program helped to reduce the level of um, area in Guyana, but it did not eliminate it. The WHO and other um, important global bodies who have studied this subject have recommended that the way to eliminate this disease from a country is to have a mass administration of medicines. And to be sure that you're getting rid of these, um, you know, filaria larvae, the best way to do is to start one year and you have like a certain level of the population, let's say about 70% of the population taking this medicine. And then you wait for about a year or a little bit more than a year and then you do a second round. We have completed that first round and we are going to do this second round. Now, our uh, second round would start in February. We are hoping to uh, start the process in early February. And by the end of, of February 2021, we would have completed the entire country. We have already started to train people to do this. Uh, we have the medication in country. We are ready to go. Um, so once uh, February next year comes around, we have a team that will be deploying, or teams that would be deployed around the country to ensure that they move around house to house, giving people this uh, second dose of medicine and the final dose. And once we are able to do this, um, for the first time, we'll be able to eliminate filaria from Guyana. But for us to do that, it takes a lot of work. Um, we need people to assist us by taking the medication. And um, once we, we, we finish this exercise, uh, we'll have an evaluation by the WHO and other partners, and they would certify whether or not we are filaria free. Uh, we are optimistic that we can become filaria free, but we need to put in the, the work. And so, um, after we complete this particular exercise, going forward, we have one less disease to worry about. And I think that's going to be important. So we can then focus our resources that we normally spend every year for file area. We can focus those resources on some other um, area that needs our attention. So we, we are very optimistic. 
um, that we can accomplish this, but we need the public's um, help. And um, hopefully by having um, you know, more educational pieces about what's going on, what we intend to do, how the public can help, that uh, surely people would come forward and assist us in, in getting rid of filaria from Guyana. Okay, I noted that uh, the WHO had done a survey in Guyana as for the regions most affected. I think among them were one, seven, eight, nine, I believe, 10. When you roll out the initial plan, are you starting in a specific area and then, you know, come down? Or we are going to start in several regions at the, at the same time and then we'll wrap up with another set of regions. So uh, they have a, a kind of rolling plan that has been worked out. But as we get closer to that date, we'll um, certainly inform people. Uh, people will be hearing more ads and so forth. But you know, with the holiday season, I don't think um, now might be the most appropriate time to start rolling out that. I think people are more focused on the holidays. So immediately after um, the holiday, we will, we will start rolling out this program in a more aggressive way. All right, and finally, uh, I know that DEC, which is, has a whole long scientific name, uh, is that the only medication being used or is there No, this here you're going to get three tablets and um, they work in combination, so that's what we're using. Okay, Minister Anthony again, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for today's COVID-19 update. Of course, we just spoke with the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony. Remember, for more information, you can log on to our website, dpi.gov.gy, and the Ministry of Health's website as well, health.gov.gy, and of course, our social media platforms.